Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking with Norman Solomon about his brand new book, War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine. Norman Solomon is co-founder of RootsAction.org and executive director of the Institute for Public Accuracy. Norman, welcome to Talk World Radio. Hey, thanks a lot, David. Thanks for coming on. So how, war seems like the most difficult thing in the world to make invisible. How do you how do you make war invisible? It's ongoing with a planet that has what seven or eight billion people and very few of us, at least in North America, have any direct experience with war. Uh, and so especially in real time in this 21st century. So we are dependent and unfortunately so on primarily news media. And uh, it's not difficult for uh, corporate news media that dominate to basically sweep realities of war under the rug. It's, uh, there, there's a lot of sins of commission, I think we'll be talking about, but it's mostly a sin of omission, right? I always assume, since I avoid the corporate media like the plague, I always assume it's putting a pro-war spin on everything. And then I find out usually that it's not mentioning that wars even exist at all for the most part. What's left out is really a very powerful. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the first quotes I put in this book, War Made Invisible, comes from Aldous Huxley. And he says, the lies are powerful, but even more powerful is silence about truth. And we're really be deafened with silence. We are getting so much that is deadly, that's avoided, that's left out. What is, as you say, the sins of omission And so in that sense, I think in the United States, we are basically walking around in a bubble 24-7, even though a bit more than half of the federal discretionary budget goes to the military, we are almost entirely clueless as to what those dollars, those billions of dollars, uh, several billions every day, really are doing. 750 military bases overseas, uh, more spending than the next 10 countries combined on the military, most of those countries being U.S. allies. And so the death and destruction, which has been so extensive in recent decades from U.S. military actions, they're off the media map, rarely mentioned. When they are mentioned, it's almost entirely about us, U.S., us, what happens to Americans. And so people who suffer directly and indirectly from U.S. wars are in a status of unpersons, non-persons. And I write in uh, the War Made Invisible book about a reality that I think is avoided and not even acknowledged, which is that fundamentally in US media and politics, when it comes to US wars, there are two tiers of grief. The ones that matter, we're told, and the ones implicitly or explicitly don't matter. And that is in the second category, people who are on the other end of U.S. firepower. You mentioned that U.S. uh, federal discretionary spending, over half of it is for wars and war preparations. Imagine if news coverage were distributed in those proportions, over half the corporate news would be about the wars and the war preparations. I imagine in reality, it's a much smaller percentage. Well, it's tiny. And a lot of what we get in terms of war coverage, media coverage of the Pentagon and military spending is very matter of fact, often in passing, so-and-so from the Pentagon said such and such, the State Department, which is really part of the military apparatus, uh, Antony Blinken, Secretary of State says thus and so, appropriations bills are um, matter of factly reported and really passed, uh, signed by the president. And so it's the omission that is so powerful And yet the ripple effects are enormous. I like to remind people that in his Riverside Church speech exactly a year before he was assassinated, uh, Dr. King uh, referred to military spending for war as a demonic suction tube. His words, very difficult to have that recalled. We all know uh, I have a dream. King talked about this demonic suction tube that was demonic overseas and at home, these ripple effects. And 
it's uh, frankly nauseating to hear so many elected officials, particularly Democrats, who uh, wax eloquent about Dr. King and his dream, happens especially twice a year on uh, Martin Luther King official holiday, and then uh, the anniversary of his assassination. And all the attribute, tributes are appropriate, but what's left out is deadly. The omission is to avoid the reality of what King was talking about, what was demonic about military spending then and now. And meanwhile, here we are, David, talking in, well, summer now of 2023, and military spending and what King called the madness of militarism is rampant. We are the proverbial fish in water, so accustomed to this deadly water, we often don't even give it a second thought. And certainly uh, the media, mass media, corporate media, and politicians rarely encourage us to give it a thought, let alone a second thought. This is, I think, one of the many, many tactics we discover in, in your book, Norman Solomon, of, of how war is made invisible, the Santa Clausification of people like Dr. King or Helen Keller or uh, any number of past figures who opposed war and you'd never know it. Another one I think that you talk about is the quick uh, or sometimes delayed rehabilitation of U.S. war criminals uh, accepted into the fold as as respectable uh, figures and statesmen and women. Uh, it, there's some examples you give in the book, right? Yes. Uh, well, so parallel, as you mentioned, parallel to making the wars and the real human toll of wars invisible and the anti-war voices, as you say, Helen Keller, Eugene Debs, Martin Luther King, sanitizing them. There's also the rehabilitation of, frankly, war criminals. And so I am really struck by, and I was hit as I uh, researched this book, uh, really struck by the ways in which people who lied us into wars, uh, it's really almost an understatement to say lied because it was so methodical. People like George W. Bush and Dick Cheney then uh, the passage of time and the importance of those who have suffered from war, uh, all that begins to recede. Uh, even for US veterans who are left with the suffering, let alone uh, those who in much larger numbers in Afghanistan and Iraq are grieving their loved ones, uh, are maimed seriously, traumatized psychologically, these folks have never been in focus in US media and to the extent slightly they were, even they're fading away. And all the treatment of people like George W. Bush um, or Dick Cheney, it is not only a travesty to bury the reality of the past, to cover it up, to euphemize it, but it's also prefigurative because it makes it easier to move forward and say as, President Obama said, we should uh, look forward, not backward. He said that about torture, but it's also a way of saying, it wasn't such a big deal after all that several thousand US troops died in Iraq, not such a big deal after all that at least many hundreds of, million, of thousands of perhaps up to a million or more Iraqi people were killed because of the uh, invasion that uh, the United States uh, inflicted on that country in 2003. And so a concrete example is uh, we have uh, the First Lady, Michelle Obama, saying publicly that she has the same values as George W. Bush. They differ on some policy, but they have the same values. Does that include the values that it's okay to lie to the public so that hundreds of thousands of people can be killed as a result with the motivation being a political edge, geopolitical positioning, helping military contractors get uh, even more outlandish profits. That goes virtually unexamined in US media. And it's a way to normalize being a war criminal. And it is a message saying that, well, if past war criminals are A-OK, -okay, then I suppose present ones are too, and future ones are too. I give that example in the book and also uh, the instance of where uh, 
a year after the January 6th attack on the Capitol, uh, Liz Cheney brought her father onto the House floor. Uh, Dick Cheney, someone who was first and foremost uh, the architect for the propaganda lies and war that brought the United States into the invasion of Iraq in March of 2003. And so we had this grotesque spectacle that I chronicle in the book of Dick Cheney going to the House floor and Democrats one after another lining up to shake his hand. And then Speaker Nancy Pelosi publicly says what an honor it was to have Dick Cheney on the floor of the House, an honor to have a war criminal there. Well, when we have that kind of society, with that, we have that kind of public culture, then this is a way of saying that it's okay to slaughter people based on deception. And underneath that, that two kinds of people exist in the world. Uh, Americans and those who we are told are American allies and friends and victims of our quote unquote enemies. And then it's everybody else, whether it's soldiers uh, who are killed by US weaponry or the much larger number of civilians who have been massacred in this century into the millions really by direct and indirect uh, results uh, by US firepower. The Costs of War Project at Brown University has documented this in detail, about 1 million people killed by the US so-called War on Terror, and several times that many killed indirectly the destruction of infrastructure, of healthcare, of sanitation, of water availability, so many different ways. So you, know, you come down to this, what kind of society do we have? What is our political economy? What is the ethos? What is unacceptable to say in public? You know, David, I have been searching around for one instance of a major US daily newspaper editorializing that George W. Bush is a war criminal. I can't find it, but I can find plenty of them saying that Vladimir Putin is a war criminal. Well, they both are, but only one can be said to be a war criminal in U.S. corporate media. Absolutely right. We're speaking with Norman Solomon. The book is called War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine. Norman, Ukraine, uh, the war in Ukraine is an exception to just about everything in just about every way, right? And uh, as with the crimes of September 11th, you suddenly have humans with stories and suffering and tragedy. Uh, I, I just can't imagine if there were that sort of reporting about any other war, about uh, about wars there's no reporting on at all, or about wars that we've been misled to believe were very sanitary, low death uh, humanitarian operations in Iraq and Afghanistan and so forth. Uh, I mean, everything is is upside down now, right? We have in US media in the last oh, 15 months or so, crystal clear examples of how wars and the effects on human beings from wars can be journalistically portrayed accurately with empathy. It should be called uh, accurate reporting because that's what it is in human terms. So we've seen that in US media in terms of uh, coverage of the war in Ukraine. Uh, we have got nothing like that in this century or for the, in memory from US corporate media, uh, whether it's uh, the US war in Afghanistan or Iraq or other places. And so it's a sort of a culturated pseudo-professional schizophrenia among journalists who are supposed to report without fear or favor. And yet the, the window on the world, so to speak, is tinted red, white, and blue. And it's, it's dehumanizing for people elsewhere in the world, but it's also dehumanizing for us because unconsciously we're encouraged to believe uh, that well, uh, certain victims of war are really um, tragically um, affected and they're really important human beings. And the implicit message is that people who die because of US wars, if they're not Americans, if they're not quote, allied forces, then they don't matter. Well, it's hard to, it's hard to think of a, more dehumanizing 
political and media culture in that sense than the one we're living in. Absolutely. I, you say accurate reporting, but maybe beyond accurate is, is more accurate, right? You give examples in the book of victims of Israeli wars finally making it into the media, but falsely presented as victims of a Russian war in Ukraine. Uh, so these are people who, who could have been presented as mattering uh, with the actual context of who they really were uh, in Palestine, but were used as, as images to make Russia look a little bit more evil in Ukraine, right? Yeah, it's sadly ironic where uh, the footage of uh, uh, Ukrainians uh, being treated so horribly and sometimes killed by Russians that that uh, was transposed in the internet and you know uh, and vice versa. So in other words, uh, according to the ethos of mass media, the same kind of treatment of human beings by Russians is horrible, but the same kind of treatment of human beings by by Israel, the treatment of Palestinians, they're not on the media map. Is rarely even mentioned at all. And if we look for sort of a through line of what the pattern is, with very rare exceptions, the kind and quantity, the quality, the tone, the amount of US media coverage of wars, and how the victims of the wars are portrayed, it all depends on who's doing the killing and who's getting killed. Meaning both, or to what degree does that mean it depends which national government is the guilty party? And to what extent is this a question of racism? Well, I think the moral compass, uh, if we can call it that, the kind of the malfunctioning or, or skewed uh, moral compass such as it is, is, is largely determined by US nationalism and the way in which journalists and huge US uh, media institutions have so internalized and accepted as implicit, kind of what Antonio Gramsci called common sense, that it's automatic uh, that a certain kind of war is good because the US is part of it or approving of it, or if uh, not totally approving of it, then wink at it if the US government is winking at it or subterraneanly um, assisting it. So that is one strong dynamic. At the same time, as I think uh, in sync with what W.B. Du Bois wrote about a very long time ago, there's not only a color line and was and is in the United States, but there's a global color line. And I think it's important to recognize that while the United States does not bomb countries where people of color live, the fact that people of color are living in countries that the United States is bombing makes it easier for the US to keep bombing them because of the political and racial climate and attitudes in the United States. It's really stunning to me that in the last few years, we've had a real upsurge and a, a good one in the United States of public discourse about institutionalized racism. We're very familiar now with the phrase systemic racism. And yet somehow by omission, because it's scarcely ever mentioned, we're supposed to assume that that systemic racism and all the institutional and attitudinal skewing that uh, is part of it, that that stops at the water's edge. I mean, it's absurd. Uh, and yet we're encouraged by omission uh, to assume that, oh, well, you know, our motivations, our national na nationhood uh, does not uh, get affected in terms of wars, in terms of racism. One thing that really startled me, I was you know, working on this book for a number of months and I sort of tried to mull over uh, the chapter that became known as uh, The Color of War. And I realized that everyone killed by US firepower during the so-called war on terror has been a person of color. I mean, talk about hidden in plain sight. This so-called war on terror has been going on for more than 20 years, and I can't think of one time I've heard from corporate media what is right in front of us, that the US government in this war has been killing virtually entirely people of color around the world. Yeah, 
we never we never see it we're never told their names their stories their humanized as they put it as if someone's not human until you know lots of details about them uh but there are even more people who die or suffer horribly because the money that goes into the war machine doesn't go into useful things i mean many many more people and that seems to be a topic of conversation that can't exist at all in u.s media yeah that brings us back to what is this true uh in uh 2023, as it was in 1967, when uh, Martin Luther King Jr. referred to uh, this, what he called the demonic suction tube. And this is, again, um, a situation where it's right in front of us. And the fact that it isn't mentioned or delved into by corporate news media doesn't mean that's because it isn't important. It's because it is so important. It is so fundamental. And an example would be, and I think people on the left ought to be self-critical about this quite often as well. We have very appropriate emphasis on the racism of police forces and the so-called justice system and the institutionalized racism of police. The fact is that many more people of color in this country and poor people generally are being killed by the misappropriation of resources, the fattening of the Pentagon budget continually that keeps going through the roof while we have slashing of social services, healthcare, education, housing, neonatal care, elderly care that is most deadly for low and middle income people who are disproportionately people of color. And if we look at it historically, we had much better leadership from people like Jesse Jackson, we had uh, John Conyers, we had Shirley Chisholm, we had uh, Ron Dellums. They were leaders of the Congressional Black Caucus uh, coming out of the Vietnam War era, and they fought like hell to get uh, more money into social service programs and more money out of, less money into this voracious Pentagon budget that was killing, as you're alluding to, David, overseas and also killing by deprivation at home. We're not getting that kind of leadership from the Congressional uh, Black Caucus anymore. Uh, it's quite the opposite. It's quite a militaristic operation. It just goes back to, we've got to be organizing. We have to be at the grassroots raising hell uh, with the 535 members of the House and Senate uh, and with all elected officials to say that this current, what Dr. King called the madness of militarism, is unacceptable. And let me, in my own biased way, uh, verbally tip my hat uh, to World Beyond War and to RootsAction.org, to organizations that are among a precious few nationally, I think, with any size and impact, insisting that we're not going to go along to get along with the warfare state. Glad to hear it. Um, th there are so many uh, ways that war is made invisible in the book that we don't have time to get to them all, but they've they've banned reporting on caskets showing the dead bodies. They've, they've pretty much concluded that air wars and drone wars aren't wars at all, that uh, they've waged wars in complete secrecy. They've left out the lasting environmental damage, the refugee crises, They've uh, used mercenaries instead of soldiers. Uh, they've used NATO instead of the US military to avoid reporting, to avoid accountability. They've severely punished whistleblowers. I mean, all of this is because there's reason to think people would care if they if they knew, right? I mean, we, we tell each other people don't care about these things, but if people wouldn't care, why did they go to such lengths to hide it? Yeah, it's a key question. Why do we need to be lied to if what the US government is doing is supposedly A-OK? -okay? We're told democracy is about uh, the uh, consent of the governed, the informed consent of the governed. But what we have really now is the uninformed consent of the governed. And so we have a burden and some responsibility to learn more. So some of that is the fault of the public, but a lot of it is the government and corporate media that keep lying both by omission and commission. I have an interview with uh, the great Daniel Ellsberg in the book, and he says that it's perhaps to the credit uh, 
of the American people that they're so thoroughly lied to about wars uh, because ostensibly they don't know half the story about what's really going on. And I think that's very true. And we all need to take responsibility to, to have a more humane society because right now, I have to say, we in the United States live in a country that is a death culture. And it's not simply by coincidence, it's very profitable. Uh, and there's a huge amount of money being made increasingly by big corporations and rich people who are like ghouls. They are getting uh, more and more what they consider to be sustenance and support from the death and destruction that their profits are directly part of. And this is our challenge to organize to change this reality. So you talked about going after legislators. What about going after the media who control everybody and legislators included? What do we do about the media problem? Yeah, there's such a negative uh, relationship, a uh, mutual support between uh, the war apparatus in Washington, where what's considered to be realistic along Pennsylvania Avenue is echoed by corporate media and vice versa. And so there's a mutual reinforcing there. I think we need to recognize that we have not only what Dwight Eisenhower in one of his uh, not too frequent lucid, lucid moments called a military industrial complex, but we have a military industrial intelligence media complex. And a lot of that all uh, morphs together, marinates together in you know, sort of a warlock's brew we could say now the relationship between Silicon Valley, which is very much a, um, a media intertwined uh, be behemoth, that's very much about surveillance, it's about intelligence, and it's about media. And uh, a lot of these corporations that are making money from huge contracts with the Pentagon are also intermeshed with media. So we need to be willing to directly challenge media outfits. Uh, you know, I'm very proud to have worked with uh, FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, which for several decades has been doing that. We need to, uh, to name the names, use the research and confront corporate media because they're part of the death apparatus. There are some great reports by FAIR cited in the book. Um, we've got about two minutes left. Norman, what do you say to people who say, well, we have to have war, Hitler, Putin, we must have war. And if we're going to have war, we must win them. And you must be on the side of the war makers. None of this independent questioning. Uh, you know, should we abolish war? Should we get rid of these horrible militaries and do things in a more civilized way? We've got uh, several thousand deployed nuclear weapons on this planet. Uh, Martin Luther King named it in his Nobel Peace Prize speech. We've got a choice. Uh, we, we have nonviolence or non-existence. The track that we're on right now is towards nuclear conflagration, which science tells us, and Dan Ellsberg has pointed this out, it wouldn't totally be omnicide. Perhaps 1% of the planet might survive, 99% of human beings would go. We have to say that that's like completely unacceptable. And as King said, we're not willing to just accept a spiral into thermonuclear hell. That really is in part what the Ukraine war is about and the way in which the United States government, rather than engaging in genuine diplomacy, has just been sending billions of dollars worth of weapons we know how this all predictably would end. Two nuclear superpowers in confrontation and escalation. We're looking at nuclear war. We have to say, absolutely not. We will resist. Very good note to end on and for humanity to hopefully continue uh, by learning. Uh, we've been speaking with Norman Solomon. The book, which you should get, is called War Made Invisible, How America Hides the Human Toll of Its Military Machine. Norman, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Hey, thank you, David. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. 
All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.